Thank you very much, Claire. It really is a privilege to be able to, to share and to have learned to be learning today and to sharing sharing today. Um, and I think that is lovely that it is a small group and I'm um, keen to hear every, who everyone else is as well. So um, as Claire said, my name is Nancy. I am a clinical educator and a sessional lecturer at the University of Advertisrand um, in Johannesburg, South Africa. I am involved in the speech language pathology department at um, Wits University. And I'm gonna go into a little bit more detail about our um, kind of the setup of our degree there, just to give you context of why I decided to use escape rooms with my students. So I'm gonna share my screen with you. Um, you can see as I'm, I'm truly South African, the beautiful scenery um, of a farm, a game farm where my sister lives. Um, so what I'm going to be doing today is we're just going to um, be looking at an uh, online escape room that I designed uh, for third year speech and language therapy students, um, and, and it was called Can You Escape Rehab? And um, I'm going to just be going through these various areas with us to look at, you know, why I even decided to do this, who it's designed for, what pedagogies did I use um, to help support why I decided to do this. Um, then practically, how did I design it? How did I bring all the pieces together? Also looking at how do you build authentic case studies? And then actually, how did it all come together? What did implementation look like? Um, and then what did the students actually think? And, and what feedback did I, I get from them? So uh, let me just, sorry, go to the next slide. So with regards to why um, we needed this, so as I said, my context is um, in, in South Africa, our speech and language therapy degrees are a four year degree in all universities and um, students don't do a like pre uh, degree or, or an undergraduate degree and then just go and do it as masters. Uh, ours is a professional specialist degree from year one to year four, where the students do go through uh, varying aspects of speech language therapy and then they they kind of start in first year just with theory and from second year they start with theory and clinical application of that theory and so they've got quite a full program in the fact that they've got to be taking in this theoretical information and then they're going and applying it quite soon after they've learned that theoretical um, knowledge. And also, if you think about it, like our students in South Africa, when they start university, they generally are 19 years old in their first year. And by the time they're graduating, they're 22, 23. So I also feel like they're quite young. Um, a lot of them haven't had exposure to, to working in very, various clinical scenarios. They've generally come from our high school system straight into our tertiary um, education system. And, and so that, that sometimes poses um, a few interesting um, challenges. And I typically work with um, our third year students and our fourth year students. So uh, I'm often involved with lecturing and teaching the theoretical knowledge to our third year students. But then I'm also a clinical educator, mainly for fourth year students in their hospital pracs, where they're needing to work in ICUs, they're needing to apply what they've learned in their third year. And we've really found such a mismatch between them what they're learning in theory and then actually being able to apply it into clinical scenarios. And this, when I was looking at research, is not like a common challenge just to speech therapists. It's a common challenge, you know, within the medical field. And I'm sure um, those of you who are in it can identify with that, that we sometimes really battle to get students to take what they've learned in theory and then do it on a patient. And I think for a lot of the students, I mean, I see it when they come into my hospital, um, even though a lot of them, you know, they're in fourth year and I often have a lot of the students at the end of third year because I've lectured them saying, oh, please, then, because we run January to December, they'll say, oh, please, in the December holidays before we start fourth year, please, can we come and spend some time with you in your hospital? Um, and I often allow them. And I mean, I've had students come in there and faint because of the setting and because they're completely overwhelmed by what they're actually seeing and what an ICU looks like. So then they're being overwhelmed by the setting, plus 
they're having difficulty now, like actually taking the theory they've learned in a nice lecture hall and applying it to a patient in front of them who's, you know, connected to a whole lot of different machines and has gone through some sort of trauma or complex medical diagnosis. So it's really a lot for them. And I really wanted to see if there was a way to bridge the gap um, for students. And when I started doing uh, uh, escape rooms, I only started doing escape rooms in 2022. And um, so it was a little bit, yeah, I think that's correct. Yeah. So it was a little bit after COVID. Um, and at that point in time, our department didn't have a simulation lab yet, um, which they do now have, which is quite nice. Um, but so I was really trying to see what is a way that I can bridge this divide for, for our students. And actually, even I started my PhD in 2021, looking at how we can bridge this gap with the divide. And I did a, a completely different approach there, but I wanted to do something else in the theory component um, because my PhD is focused more on clinical education um, than on um, the theoretical component. And so what we did is, uh, so it was actually quite nice. I went to a um, the Barcelona Conference of Education in 2022 and there was a an American lady I've actually forgotten her name but I checked it wasn't you Brianna because I almost thought was it you and then I went and checked the presenters again but she spoke on using escape rooms for nursing and interdisciplinary collaboration between psychiatric nurses and medical nurses and I was like I was so inspired by her presentation and it was so nice because also when she did her presentation I think there were one or two of us in the room and it was an in-person um, conference. So I really got to chat a lot with her. She got to show me some of the technicalities of what she did and how she used it, which really helped me then to develop my um, uh, uh, escape room. And the whole objective for my escape rooms um, was for in this healthcare setting, I really wanted to find a way that could help students learn their theoretical underpinnings of the communication disorders, and then also be able to apply it to a patient and look at it for assessment and management across a continuum of care. Um, and I really wanted to just continuously help students into how do they integrate theory and consider how do they apply it in a, cl a clinical scenario. So that's why I needed it. And I really liked what someone said earlier, you know, with like, you know, how we're doing um, escape rooms and puzzles and, you know, trying to to figure things out for learning. And like one thing that really struck out for me this morning, and I actually ended up adding the slide, I think it was it was Liz after Liz's presentation. And I was like, wow, our patients when we're working in a medical setting are actually puzzles to unlock and um, to be able to integrate um, information and be able to figure them out so that we can then really provide the best assessment and treatment possible for them. So, um, and I thought that was even quite nice. What, you know, when I do an escape room again, I almost want to gamify from that point of view as well. It gave me a few new ideas. Um, but so, the purpose of this specific escape room was, as I said earlier, for our third year speech therapy students. The module that I um, lectured for the past two years was um, traumatic brain injury and motor speech disorders. Um, and so there's quite a, a big chunk that they were having to learn um, about what happens when a brain undergoes a traumatic brain injury, and then how do we assess that, and what is evidence-based practice, and then motor speech disorders, um, or things like um, difficulty talking due to a brain injury, either a traumatic brain injury or a stroke, or due to um, other kind of um, neurological disorders. And um, there really is quite a continuum of care. So you end up working with patients from when they're acute care, so when they're in the hospital, attached to ventilators, pipes everywhere, um, they're on um, feeding tubes, and they're quite medically unstable, all the way to when they're in an inpatient rehab, to outpatient rehab, to community reintegration. And I also just thought students needed to be aware of that continuum of, of care. And then, as I said, um, it's something that they generally do in the second half of their third year, and then they've got to apply it from the January of the next year in their fourth year when they start clinical prax. So 
when I wanted to understand why I was doing this and and what would what would be the basis for doing it, I had an integration of a few um, pedagogies. So obviously we all know social constructivist approach and how um, we we learn through building stories and through working together and through engaging um, and through teamwork. Um, and then I also wanted to bring in the case-based learning. And someone this morning also spoke about, you know, like how they were, um, at, I think it was um, the panel from Australia where they said, you know, uh, in the epidemiology, they had like death by case study. And what I've also found in the speech therapy lectures and that we sometimes just present case studies and we make students talk about them and they kind of get sick of it. And I don't feel like they're in, they engaged really nicely with the case based learning. They're like, kind of like, oh, I've done this so many times. Do I have to keep doing it? And so I wanted to, I thought escape rooms could provide a really nice different framing of case-based learning so that students could have to apply their theoretical knowledge with a case, but in the gamified way, but also making the case more real. Um, and you'll see how I'll explain how I did that as we uh, a little bit later on. And then also the, I really like a humanistic theory where you are learner-centered. Um, and I do really like the self-determination theory of learning because that, it, kind of ties into motivation and it's um, about their autonomy, their agency, um, the fact that they have, um, let me just, sorry, I've blanked on the three words. I know that what I know what they stand for, but <laughs> I just wanted to, um, so it, it, it's autonomy, relatedness and competence um, in that self-determination theory. And that's what drives motivation. And I, I'm really passionate when I'm doing teaching to think, how can I, make this learning um how can i make it more related for the students how can i show them competence and how can i give them autonomy um within their learning um and i felt like through an escape room um, they could really experience this so designing an escape room so this is um when uh, when I reflected on my process of designing it, um, as well as looking at the literature, I came up with these four steps. And it was quite nice because I know a lot of it was spoken about this morning as well. Um, but that first point of defining your outcomes, how you need to look at your outcomes of your escape room really have to align with the general outcomes for your course. And then those outlines guide your design and that also then helps you to decide when you're going to time your online escape room. And I mean, I know there was a question earlier about someone saying, you know, can you turn a whole module into escape room or, and when should you do escape rooms? And I really like this because I, my, and I'll show you in the next slide, my outcome was about integration and integration across a continuum of care. So the timing of it, I needed it to do at the end of my, um, my module because I wanted something that would take everything that they've learned across the seven weeks that they were with me and be able to apply it to a patient. Then because of me, my online escape room, the development of my storyline was around a case study. Um, it's really quite important that we are quite selective in the case study we do, and I'll go into that a little bit more detail. Um, then again, as I said, I wanted to develop this case um, against a, across a whole continuum. And then I was also quite mindful of the engagement strategies that I wanted to use. And I'll go into, into that as well um, in a bit more detail. So first of all, these were my outcomes and I had to define my outcomes. And I actually gave the students the outcomes right at the beginning of the escape room. And I'll, I'll take you through my escape room just now. But I wanted the students to know explicitly at the beginning what I was wanting them to learn. Because sometimes I feel like, especially with the students and the generation that they are, they really need it to be made explicit to them. They need thinking to be made explicit to them, the processes to make, be made explicit to them. And I wanted them to know that this escape room, yes, it was, they were all very excited because they were like, oh, escape rooms, we love escape rooms. And I, I did have a massive slab of chocolate as a, a prize if they escaped. So they were all very excited for their chocolate. But I wanted them to also be mindful about what was the underlying purpose of this online escape room that we were going to be doing. And to be mindful that this was to help shape their thinking skills for when they were in fourth year in clinical practice. So those were those outcomes there. Then also with our cases, it's really important when you do build a case that it, it should be authentic. 
you should have a, a patient narrative. Um, it needs to align, obviously, with the learning outcomes, provide educational value, stimulate students' interest, and then obviously promote your clinical decision-making skills. And what really helps with the case study and what I like doing with an online case study um, in the online escape room was I could add in the patient story with videos, um, with some written information, with a made up assessment results, because it was it was one of my patients who agreed to participate, but he I only saw him in that cute phase. So I kind of had to generate what I would expect for the various phases. Um, but it really then did does help with promoting the empathy and the realism. And when I opened the case, I mean, this this gentleman's case, it was quite a sad case, but I also did choose it because I knew it would kind of evoke emotions in the students so that it would make them empathetic. And it was rea real to what actually happens for some of our patients. Um, also, what I did is I tried to make the case study also more authentic from the team members. So I didn't just make it about like, the client and them as a speech therapist, but I wanted them to also think about the fact that like, generally when they are in fourth year, they're still obviously students and they always have a clinical supervisor. So I was around when they did the online escape room so that if they needed the support of a clinical supervisor, they uh, they could either send me a message or they could put up their hand and come and uh, come and assist them because I also wanted them to know like someone you know when they were talking about cheating and that earlier like for our students they always have a clinical supervisor and they have us so that they can ask us questions so I wanted to simulate that as well um, within the online uh, escape room all right so the engagement strategies then that I wanted. Obviously, we want something that's intellectually stimulating. We want to promoting active engagement. So what I also made sure when I did the online escape room, I used a variety of question forms. I used a variety of different like kind of levels of questioning um, based on um, the, the questioning hierarchies. Um, also, what I really wanted to do is when I was planning this, I kept thinking, I want them to think like clinicians. I don't want them to think like they're needing to answer a theoretical assignment. I want them I want them to have to emulate their critical thinking that we use as a clinician when a patient is in front of us. So what I did is I scaffolded the questioning. I used questions that supported the linking of theory to clinical practice. And I really just, through that scaffolding, I wanted to guide their thinking. And I'm just going to jump to the slide ahead, um, and then I'll talk about the patient goals as well. But what I did is I found this, and I found this um, thinking, critical th thinking strategies that help to guide how I structured questions as well. Um, and I really like these. It, it was um, in a, an article for teaching medical students in critical care units. And its premise is about first making thinking process explicit um, and then discussing cognitive biases and debiasing strategies, which I've, I failed to incorporate that. I must admit in my escape room and I'd want to just do a bit more of that. But then I wanted to model what the kind of questions I asked, the inductive reasoning and then I also asked questions to stimulate critical thinking um, and then um, then this whole activity was to you know assess um, their critical thinking skills and that's also where why I also had them having to write goals because we also find students obviously as a therapist we need to have goals and aims and know what we're working towards and what we're working on um, and the students sometimes really battle with that so they needed to write um, goals for me at the end of each stage that would match whatever the patient was at. Um, so that also then promoted um, their critical thinking, um, their ability to um, have inductive reasoning and just to make that thinking process of how do we set goals a little bit more explicit for them. So, all right, so implementation, how does it all come together? So with the implementation, um, I would like to just, I'll show you a video first, then I'll go and show you the actual thing because I think it's quite nice. So uh, two years ago, I had a student who was an Instagram queen and um, she loved everything was on Instagram. And I did ask her permission if I could use this reel she made um, of the students doing the the 
uh, escape room in, in our lecture. And what I really liked is, again, as someone said earlier, and I actually, um, yeah, I just made sure it sounds on, but someone said earlier, you can hear how the dynamics in the classroom change and the noise levels. And I love that. Um, and you'll hear that hopefully as well in, in this short video. So let me just play it for you. And then, um, yeah. Lecturer, set up an escape room for our lecture. Okay, so it was a nice short one, but you could hear the noise even when the music stopped and that, and there was a lot of discussion, a lot of dynamics. What I also really liked about it was I could go around and listen to how they were thinking and how they were processing and what they were discussing, um, which was really, really helpful because there were some clear, like, theoretical misunderstandings that then I could jump in immediately and say, hang on, I overheard you saying X, Y, and Z. Can you explain to me why you think X, Y, and Z are not A, B, and C? And it helped me then to also immediately in that setting help uh, them learn so that, you know, if it was a real patient, they had the correct theoretical underpinnings. So what I'll do is I'm going to share this screen. So what I really like, um, and I, this I, I learned about, oh, sorry, I think my internet did something funny for a second. Um, yeah, I'm back, hey. Okay, so I really like to use um, Genially um, to design a um, online escape room. Um, I, it's just they've got really nice templates. So I know we're all busy and we all, you know, are quite busy in our, in our worlds. So I found this really, really helpful for me. Um, I also really like its interactive elements and um, just kind of it's, it's very user friendly from both the design perspective as well as for the students um, being able to use it. So I'm going to show it to you in the sorry in the student mode. So this was um, and also the point for my students was it was also about making them think about community reintegration. So as I said we gave the, the objectives so that it was explicit for them. Um, and then it, I gave them information of each of the team members. So, for example, I gave them innocent story. So it was quite an in-depth story because you do really want to create it. So he was a 24 year old man and first language is not English. Uh, he was employed as an insurance broker, lives with a girlfriend, is pregnant. Um, and he was a successful insurance broker, valued by his employers, ambitious, friendly, well liked. Um, he'd, and and unfortunately, this is really a true story. He had a successful month at work and he bought a new television and surround sound system and his friends helped him deliver it. And then later that night, they attacked him and stole his stuff. Um, and so he ended up being stabbed in the head and the neck um, and ended up in, in our ICU. Um, and then I had to give them there's a little bit of his um, medical history at the bottom. Um, and then I gave them information about themselves, <laughs> just so that they know who they are. Um, and then a bit of information about the, the clinical um, supervisor. And I had the four missions set up, um, escaping from trauma ICU, inpatient rehab and outpatient rehab, um, and then community reintegration. And I didn't want them to just skip through and kind of go fast. So at the end, when they had to fill in Google Forms, the Google Forms actually gave them a password so that they could get to the next level, which was quite good because then the students who tried to cheat and not fill in the goals were like, Mrs. Barber, we can't get to the next one. And I was like, well, have you done the goals and have you filled in? Oh, no, we didn't. We didn't want to do that. So I was like, hmm, fill it in, carry on. So I liked that. Um, but yeah, so then this is how also at least um, this was a, a little short video on him so that they could also see what the patient looks like in an ICU setting and um, not be afraid of someone who's got pipes and everything everywhere. Um, so I'll just show you a short bit of his video. So, did you come out before us again? Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Okay, good. And then put your tongue into the left hand side. So it's a bit. Okay, good. Now tell me the days of the week. Start at Sunday for me. Monday. Monday. Yeah, so you can hear there's a lot of background noise. There's everything else that's going on in the ICU. So it created a realistic atmosphere also for the students. What I also did is you can see it is quite a long video, but I did a, I, I videoed a full assessment that I would do as an initial assessment for a patient so that the students also got to, in a way, also observe um, an assessment being done. Um, and as you can see here, so what I did is like I started with questions that were more theoretical because they've also got to think, like when I'm looking at this person, what do I need to know from the theory side um, uh, when I'm making a, dif a differential diagnosis? And what I also did is that if they chose the wrong answer, I kind of gave them a, oops, not quite right, keep trying encouragement. Um, uh, but then if they got it, oh, I'm, I'm not even getting it right. I can't remember the answers. Um, I promise you I'm a good speech therapist. But then when you get the answers right, it would take, and then even here, then I said, okay, so now when you were watching this video, and I kept giving them the video again and again, you know, what do you observe? So now you know what you've had to look for from a theoretical point of view, but in this specific patient, what are you seeing? And these are the three areas we have to look at. So what are you actually seeing um, when you're observing this patient? So that now they've had to take that information, look at him, and decide what they have seen. So everything was reduced okay and then again from him talking and that what perceptual characteristics they need to listen because often we find with the students they really do battle with saying okay actually what does the word prosody mean what does the word resonance mean you know though because they're very specific for speech therapists so it's really also nice because it's a way that if you've got healthcare students and you're needing to um kind of um help them to identify specific features that they would assess that when they're diagnosing a patient. This is also a nice way to get them to engage with it. Um, and I think it was that one. Yeah, phew. Um, and then again, then it asked them, so what I did with like with that um, step ladder of thinking, I kind of started with theory, made them think of applying it to innocent, and then they needed to make a bigger, broader understanding about Okay, so now with all this information from the last three questions, how would you actually then diagnose him, which is what we which is what we would want. Um, okay, and it was that one. And then again, that was then further diagnosis because we look at diagnosis and then we need the subset um, and they needed to be able to identify that as well. So it really then took the critical thinking another um, level further but then also as you could see all those questions were about one aspect it was all about his speech where now it was like okay what other things should you actually be a, a worried about assessing as well and not just so that they didn't just fixate on one i'm just going to press continue okay and then what was nice is we had the the goal writing um, and it was nice because that's what i like with genially as well you can just embed it right in here so they don't have to be jumping around between um, uh, different platforms. Um, I just want to, um, and kind of, I, I could put it all in there. And then when you press submit, um, then, and I made, I was very, I made all the my passwords, keywords from there, um, uh, from it, so that they could, from the learning, so that they could at least, hopefully, <laughs> it would carry on reinforcing. Um, and then again, so then when with inpatient rehab, again, it's saying now, okay, so now what do you need to think about? Um, because obviously within our, our context as well, like I said there, you know, we need to, in our context especially, and I'm sure in other contexts, we need to consider persons if their first language is not English. What are their levels of education? Um, what are their cultural um, beliefs? What are their support systems? And we're, we're always, you know, uh, wanting our students to to focus on that, as well as access and socioeconomic status um, within the South African context. Um, you know, I'm lucky to work in private, but for a lot of these, for a lot of our patients, they access services through government facilities, um, and then that impacts. So we always want our students to be thinking about that as well. I don't know what the answer was. Oh, good, I chose right. Okay, I thought it was that. And then again, now this stage, 
what are the things you need to focus on? And then I gave them my embedded results from assessments and then made them have to look at it and make sense of it so that they could understand what they would need to work on um, for this gentleman. Um, so yeah, and then basically I'm going to just skip across to here so that I don't have to go through all the questions, but this really helped them. Um, and then we also used um, things like also functional communication checklists where he was at, so that not only did they look at impairment-based assessments and have to make sense of it, what functionally could he do, and then develop therapy goals um, from that, um, which was quite important. And then once they escaped that level, um, we had outpatient rehab, and what's quite important in outpatient rehab, we are, we are, especially with people who've had head injuries, we often need them to be thinking about what is the family finding, as well as what is the patient finding, because a lot of our patients with head injuries don't have good insight. So this was also to teach students to take information from multiple um, multiple um, participants, if you want to call it that, and then how do you use information from different family members and the patient in order to be able to make decisions. Um, so really trying to just simulate what it is like um, in real life. And then finally for, you know, um, community reintegration, it was just looking at, okay, what do we need to look at now? How do we, how do we support this patient at this level? Um, what are aspects of the various therapeutic techniques? So I was able to build um, that all in um, at this level. So it really was nice to show them that continuum of, of care. Um, so then, with regards to the student feedback, um, what was quite nice is I got them to just do this word cloud afterwards and I did get them to fill in a Google form um, and then we also did a reflection afterwards. And I think like earlier presentations did say that reflection afterwards was really key for them to talk about, yeah, I actually hadn't thought about all the theoretical we work we had done, how it actually applies to a patient. And I found that quite interesting because we always assume these are students who've been seeing patients since their second year. So you think that they've gotten an understanding of actually everything we're learning is for application to a patient one day. But that doesn't, it just, it seems to be still that such a big divide. And it was really nice to hear them after afterwards saying kind of what I want, what I wanted to hear without say, you know, without me prompting them, but for them to actually say, oh, you know, now I actually thought, how do I use it? Um, you know, with a patient. Um, they also really enjoyed the teamwork because how I did it, I just did it in pairs or threes, because i I know someone earlier said they like groups of five, but I still find with our students, our classes are generally small. So there's about I don't know, maximum 35 students. And I find if I do big groups, it doesn't work. Um, so I prefer to keep it two or three because then everyone does actually participate and kind of be involved. Um, I also didn't have any time limits on this. The only time limit was kind of whoever finished first got the chocolates, but they had to have written good goals. I checked the goals and in the reflection time afterwards, we also went through goals and how do we write the goals and who wrote goal, like what the various goals were and if they were um, correct, you know, like adequate or not. Um, and, and I thought it was really, really great to see how they had learned. And then what was interesting for me is then I got to see them as fourth years the next year in my hospital, working with patients and it was quite interesting to see and um, because I had a student who hadn't done my course with me because she'd had a year off or something and there was definitely a difference between the students who had gone through an escape room trying to use their theoretical work in a slightly more clinical application than those who who didn't but um but yeah that's um that's kind of what I've what I um what I've really enjoyed about this.